Good morning. Welcome to Teddy Talks for this Thursday, April 30th, 2020. And indeed, this is our 26th day with the 26th president in the month of April. To uh, any of you who have visited along the way, and, and even to a few of you who've been uh, with this program since day one, thank you from the bottom of my heart, bringing uh, Theodore Roosevelt to life through his actual words spoken in speeches over a century ago. Uh, it's something that I've wanted to do for some time, and uh, you uh, hearing those words and perhaps sharing them with family and friends or, or just uh, keeping them to yourself and being inspired, I I hope that that's been part of the program for you. Uh, on this April 30th, uh, we give thanks for another beautiful day in Medora. Things are greening up beautifully. And we are looking forward to a soft opening of the Rough Riders Hotel, uh, the Bully Pulpit Golf Course, and the Pizza Saloon, uh, which will have uh, carryout, curbside. And we're looking forward to some pizza tomorrow in Medora. On this uh, April 30th, uh, on this date in history, well, it's, it's Louisiana Day. Uh, it's the date not only of the Louisiana Purchase by the United States in 1803, a great expanse of land, uh, including the Dakotas, and much more that doubled the size of our young nation, $15 million purchased from Napoleon's France, uh, he could use the money to fight against uh, uh, the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe combined against him, and and uh, in the meanwhile uh, would have less distraction uh, with regards to uh, uh, goings on in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, then, 1812, on this very date, Louisiana statehood uh, uh, came about, and and uh, uh, fascinating how quickly that state came into the Union. Its strategic port. Uh, mouth of the great uh, Mississippi uh, by which we would do commerce with the world. And, uh, and then statehood here in the Dakotas, uh, waiting until 1889 for North and South Dakota. And if I recall, apologies if I'm misrecalling, but I, I do believe that uh, Montana and uh, either Idaho or Wyoming uh, date to the same year of 1889. On this date in 1885 in New York, Governor David B. Hill signs legislation creating the Niagara Reservation. Niagara Falls, New York's first state park. It is a beautiful place to stroll. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was an advocate of decommercializing. Uh, imagine if you put Las Vegas uh, stretching across the Niagara Falls. Uh, wire walkers, tchotchke salespeople, all sorts of uh, showmen of all sorts. And so... Uh, of course, there would still be very important industry, electricity generation done uh, in and at Niagara Falls, but eventually a, a destination for honeymooners from throughout the world. Uh, when we say the first state park, we, of course, acknowledge that the Adirondack State Park uh, had been uh, authorized both by uh, Constitution uh, and legislation in 1884, legislation in 1885, uh, that uh, still left the park uh, undefined uh, with regards to counties and towns included until 1894. And in the spirit of uh, uh, the creation of state parks in New York, when you uh, are able to visit uh, that uh, great historic uh, city, you might take a trip over to the Palisades Interstate Park. It's along the western shore of the Hudson River and, and uh, is combined uh, between the states of New York and New Jersey. I'm not incorrect, would include uh, either in or very nearby the, the site in Weehawken, where Aaron Burr shot uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, in their famous duel. Interesting that uh, the governor, so the interstate park comes in during TR's governorship in 1900. The governor of New Jersey at that time, a Republican, Foster McGowan Voorhees, a good Dutch name, and uh, it's been wonderful to discover that uh, while touring throughout North Dakota, uh, there's a wonderful institution to our east uh, that you can pass when you come out on Interstate 94, stop in and visit the historic campus of University of Jamestown. Uh, I do believe that uh, Jamestown is where we've got a, a bison preserve as well and, and a, a giant fiberglass uh, bison that might be stated to be the largest bison uh, in the world in its replication. In any case, the uh, the grantee, the, the person who was the sponsor financially 
of the beautiful uh, chapel at University of Jamestown was Mrs. Voorhees of New Jersey. And so uh, these wonderful uh, little histories, mysteries, and implications. I look forward to finding if there's a strong familial connection between uh, uh, Governor Foster McGowan Voorhees of New Jersey and the Mrs. Voorhees, who was the benefactor of Voorhees Chapel. Uh, the uh, timing works out. I believe the, the chapel uh, postdates uh, the governorship by a decade or so. On this date in, uh, eight, in 1900, Hawaii was organized as an official United States territory. Uh, there was a, a, a complicated relationship, certainly, with uh, Hawaii. But we were quite concerned in the early 19th century with uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, Germany, uh, acquiring, uh, uh, fortifying uh, Hawaii. In 1842, our United States Secretary of State, the famous former Senator Daniel Webster, corresponded with Hawaii, expressing these concerns. Treaties were established in 1849, uh, a treaty of friendship, 1875, a, a treaty of trade. Uh, meanwhile, Americans uh, establishing plantations, uh, uh, pineapple plantations especially, and, and the name Samuel Dole should uh, come to mind, and the Dole Fruit Company, is it the Dole American Fruit Company that would play an important role both in Hawaii and in the history of Central America and elsewhere. And then it was in uh, 1893 that Samuel Dole and other Americans uh, participated in the uh, overthrow. Uh, sometimes it's uh, said the abdication of the queen, uh, Liliulu Kalani, uh, but uh, most say that it was indeed forced. There was a role of the United States Navy played therein. Uh, the United States uh, minister uh, 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 was uh, representing uh, to the uh, government and as did the Americans in 1894. Uh, President Cleveland showed himself opposed to the annexation of Hawaii. It, it would occur in uh, 1899, I believe, is the effective date uh, uh, under uh, President McKinley. And then, of course, uh, organized as an official territory of the United States in 1900. You will occasionally find Theodore Roosevelt's comments on the stump in 1900 as the vice presidential candidate speaking in favor of the actions that were taken in Hawaii. 75 years ago on this date, Adolf Hitler, the horrible despot who had laid ruin uh, to uh, uh, half of the world, uh, he was defeated in the final moments, uh, taking his own worthless life uh, in his bunker in Berlin. Over 400,000 Americans gave their lives in World War II many in the Pacific against the uh, uh, Nazi ally, the Japanese Empire, uh, and uh, VJ Day would not occur until August. But uh, very shortly after the uh, news of Hitler's suicide, uh, peace uh, surrender would be uh, undertaken uh, by, uh, uh, by the German government, and we would celebrate VE Day. 75 years ago, on occasion, you'll still meet a veteran who served in World War II. That gentleman, if he was 20, would be 95 years old. Uh, perhaps we've got some folks in their 90s and some centenarians, and, and uh, when it's uh, safe to do so, I hope we can go out and give a great big last hurrah to our World War II veterans. But here at Medora, we have a Veterans Appreciation Endowment that allows us to have a Veterans Appreciation Day at our Medora Musical, a, uh, a beer keg reception uh, at the Pitchfork Steak Fondue, and a, a night when every veteran of the United States uh, is uh, free at the Medora Musical. It's my pleasure to work with that Veterans Endowment and to work with uh, a good friend of mine, uh, John Jacobson, uh, Colonel John Jacobson from uh, Bismarck. Uh, we'll uh, be working with some folks out here to uh, assist the Western North Dakota Honor Flight Program, a program that promises to bring uh, folks from North Dakota, World War II veterans and their, uh, uh, and their attendants, uh, their helpers to uh, visit the beautiful World War II Memorial that was built uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, we'll fill up first with World War II veterans and then uh, Korea veterans and and others uh, to fill the uh, to fill the flight, and and that's uh, again, good Lord willing, and the circumstances provide. That's a bit of this date in history. Uh, this is the twenty sixth day with the twenty sixth president. Uh, that's a uh, a second choice title for the program. 
The first choice was 26 minutes with the uh, 26th president. And you can see that I think we've only landed the program a couple of times within that 26 minutes. We may do so today. Just one speech today. Oh, also on this date in history, I promised this in the uh, uh, promotional notes that had come out. Uh, on this day in the wee hours of the morning in Vaughan, Mississippi, uh, the engineer saved the passengers on the Cannonball Express, a train that in four parts along the Illinois Central made its way from Chicago, Illinois, down to New Orleans, Louisiana. And Casey Jones uh, uh, shouted out for his firemen to jump. Mr. Webb did so. Casey Jones brought that train, which was making up for lost time and, and had just about done so. Uh, there was a train on the tracks waiting at Vaughan, Mississippi. Casey Jones stayed with his engine and uh, is said through railroad lore uh, to have saved the passengers on the Cannonball Express. Of course, leading to a famous ballad. Uh, in Medora, we would probably prefer the uh, Johnny Cash version. Some of my old Suwannee friends uh, would like the Grateful Dead version of Casey Jones. Died this day, 1900, Vaughan, Mississippi. There are a couple of uh, museums down in the Jackson, Mississippi, and Memphis, Mississippi area that tell his, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jackson, Tennessee, and Memphis, Tennessee area that tell his story. These are the remarks of President Theodore Roosevelt at the dedication uh, ceremonies for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, Missouri, something that would uh, celebrate the centennial again of the doubling of the United States uh, uh, just uh, a couple of decades uh, uh, prior, uh, after its independence. St. Louis, Missouri, April 30th, 1903. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset of my address, let me recall to the minds of my hearers that the soil upon which we stand before it was ours was successively the possession of two mighty empires, Spain and France, whose sons made a deathless record of heroism in the early annals of the New World. No history of the Western country can be written without paying heed to the wonderful part played therein in the early days by the soldiers, missionaries, explorers, and traders who did their work for the honor of the proud banners of France and Castile. While the settlers of English-speaking stock and those of Dutch, German, and Scandinavian origin, who were associated with them, were still clinging close to the eastern seaboard. The pioneers of Spain and France had penetrated deep into the hitherto unknown wilderness of the West, had wandered far and wide within the boundaries of what is now our mighty country. The very cities themselves, St. Louis, New Orleans, Santa Fe, bear witness by their titles to the nationalities of their founders. It was not until the revolution had begun that the English-speaking settlers pushed west across the Alleghenies, and not until a century ago that they entered into possess the land upon which we now stand. We have met here today to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the event, which more than any other, after the foundation of the government and always accepting its preservation, determined the character of our national life, determined that we should be a great expanding nation instead of relatively a small and stationary one. Of course, it was not with the Louisiana Purchase that our career of expansion began. In the middle of the Revolutionary War, the Illinois region, including the present states of Illinois and Indiana, was added to our domain by force of arms as a sequel to the adventurous expedition of George Rogers Clark and his frontier riflemen. Later, the treaties of Jay and Pinckney materially extended our real boundaries to the West, but none of these events was of so striking a character as to fix the popular imagination. The old 13 colonies had always claimed that their rights stretched westward to the Mississippi, and vague and unreal though these claims were until made good by conquest, settlement, and diplomacy, they still served to give the impression that the earliest westward movements of our people were little more than the filling in of already existing national boundaries. But there could be no illusion about the acquisition of the vast territory beyond the Mississippi, stretching westward to the Pacific, 
which in that day was known as Louisiana. This immense region was admittedly the territory of a foreign power of a European kingdom. None of our people had ever laid claim to a foot of it. Its acquisition could in no sense be treated as rounding out any existing claims. When we acquired it, we made evident once for all that consciously and of set purpose, we had embarked on a career of expansion, that we had taken our place among those daring and hardy nations who risk much with the hope and desire of winning high position among the great powers of the earth. As is so often the case in nature, the law of development of a living organism showed itself in its actual workings to be wiser than the wisdom of the wisest. This work of expansion was by far the greatest work of our people during the years that intervened between the adoption of the Constitution and the outbreak of the Civil War. There were other questions of real moment and importance, and there were many which at the time seemed such to those engaged in answering them. But the greatest feat of our forefathers of the, those generations was the deed of the men who, with pack train or wagon train on horseback, on foot, or by boat, pushed the frontier ever westward across the continent. Never before had the world seen the kind of national expansion which gave our people all that part of the American continent lying west of the 13 original states. The greatest landmark in which was the Louisiana Purchase. Our triumph in this process of expansion was indissolubly bound up with the success of our peculiar kind of federal government. And this success has been so complete that because its very completeness, we now sometimes fail to appreciate not only the all importance, but the tremendous difficulty of the problem with which our nation was originally faced. When our forefathers joined to call into being this nation, they undertook a task for which there was but little encouraging precedent. The development of civilization from the earliest period seemed to show the truth of two propositions. In the first place, it had always proved exceedingly difficult to secure both freedom and strength in any government. And in the second place, it had always proved well nigh impossible for a nation to expand without either breaking up or becoming a centralized tyranny. With the success of our effort to combine a strong and efficient national union, able to put down disorder at home and to maintain our honor and interest abroad, I have not now to deal. The success was signal and all important, but it was by no means unprecedented in the same sense that our type of expansion was unprecedented. The history of Rome and of Greece illustrates very well the two types of expansion which had taken place in ancient time and which had been universally accepted as the only possible types up to that period when as a nation we ourselves began to take possession of this continent. The Grecian states performed remarkable feats of colonization but each colony, as soon as created, became entirely independent of the mother state, and in after years was almost as apt to prove its enemy as its friend. Local self-government, local independence was secured, but only by the absolute sacrifice of anything resembling national unity. In consequence, the Greek world, for all its wonderful brilliancy and the extraordinary artistic, literary, and philosophical development which has made all mankind its debtors for the ages, was yet wholly unable to withstand a formidable foreign foe, save spasmatically. As soon as powerful, permanent empires arose on its outskirts, the Greek states in the neighborhood of such empires fell under their sway. National power and greatness were completely sacrificed to local liberty. With Rome, the exact opposite occurred. The imperial city rose to absolute dominion over all the peoples of Italy, and then expanded her rule over the entire civilized world by a process which kept the nation strong and united, but gave no room whatever for local liberty and self-government. All other cities and countries were subject to Rome. In consequence, this great and masterful race of warriors, rulers, road builders, and administrators stamped their indelible impress upon all the afterlife of our race. And yet let an over-centralizing uh, eat out the vitals of their empire until it became an empty shell, so that when the barbarians came, they destroyed only what had already become worthless to the world. 
The underlying vicious, viciousness of each type of expansion was plain enough, and the remedy now seemed simple enough. But when the fathers of the Republic first formulated the Constitution under which we live, this remedy was untried, and no one could foretell how it would work. They themselves began the experiment almost immediately by adding new states to the original 13. Excellent people in the East viewed this initial expansion of the country with great alarm, exactly as during the colonial period, many good people in the mother country thought it highly important that settlers should be kept out of the Ohio Valley in the interest of the fur companies. So after we had become a nation, many good people on the Atlantic coast felt grave apprehension lest they might somehow be hurt by the westward growth of the nation. These good people shook their heads over the formation of the states in the fertile Ohio Valley, which now forms part of the heart of our nation. And they declared that the destruction of the Republic had been accomplished when through the Louisiana Purchase, we acquired nearly half of what is now that same Republic's present territory. Nor was their feeling unnatural. Only the adventurous and the far-seeing can be expected heartily to welcome the process of expansion. For the nation that expands is a nation which is entering upon a great career. And with greatness, there must of necessity come perils, which daunt all save the most stout-hearted. We expanded by carving the wilderness into territories, and out of these territories building new states, when once they had received as permanent settlers a sufficient number of our own people. Being a practical nation, we have never tried to force on any section of our new territory an unsuitable form of government merely because it was suitable for another section under different conditions. Of the territory covered by the Louisiana Purchase, a portion was given statehood within a few years. Another portion has not been admitted to statehood, although a century has elapsed. Doubtless it soon will be. In each case, we showed the practical governmental genius of our race by devising methods suitable to meet the actual existing needs, not by insisting upon the application of some abstract shibboleth to all our new possessions alike, no matter how incongruous this ap application might sometimes be. Over by far, the major part of the territory, however, our people spread in such numbers during the course of the 19th century that we were able to build up state after state, each with exactly the same complete local independence in all matters affecting purely its own domestic interests as in any of the original 13 states, each owing the same absolute fealty to the union of all states, which each of the original 13 states also owes, and finally, each having the same proportional right to its share in shaping and directing the common policy of the Union, which is possessed by any other state, whether of the original 13 or not. This process now seems to us part of the natural order of things, but it was wholly unknown until our own people devised it. It seems to us a mere matter of course, a matter of elementary right and justice, that in the deliberations of the national representative bodies, the representatives of a state which came into the Union but yesterday stand on a footing of exact and entire equality with those of the commonwealths whose sons once signed the Declaration of Independence. But this way of looking at the matter is purely modern and in its origin purely American. When Washington during his presidency saw new states come into the Union on a footing of complete equality with the old, every European nation which had colonies still administered them as dependencies and every other mother country treated the colonists not as a self-governing equal, but as a subject. The process which we began has since been followed by all the great peoples who were capable both of expansion and of self-government. And now the world accepts it as the natural process, as the rule. But a century and a quarter ago, it was not merely exceptional. It was unknown. This, then, is the great historic significance of the movement of continental expansion in which the Louisiana Purchase was the most striking single achievement. It stands out in marked relief even among the feats of a nation of pioneers, a nation whose people have from the beginning been picked out by a process of natural selection from among the most enterprising individuals of the nations of Western Europe. The acquisition of the territory is a credit to the broad and far-sighted statesmanship of the great statesman to whom it was immediately due, and above all to the aggressive and masterful character of the hardy pioneer folk
to whose restless energy these statesmen gave expression and direction, whom they followed rather than led. The history of the land comprised within the limits of the purchase is an epitome of the entire history of our people. Within these limits, we have gradually built up state after state until now they many times surpass in wealth and population and in many-sided development the original 13 states as they were when their delegates met in the Continental Congress. The people of these states have shown themselves mighty in war with their fellow man and mighty in strength to tame the rugged wilderness. They could not thus have conquered the forest and the prairie, the mountain and the desert, had they not possessed the great fighting virtues, the qualities which enable a people to overcome the forces of hostile men and hostile nature. On the other hand, they could not have used a right to their conquest had they not in addition possessed the qualities of self-mastery and self-restraint, the power of acting in combination with their fellows, the power of yielding obedience to the law and of building up an orderly civilization. Courage and hardihood are indispensable virtues in a people, but the people which possesses no others can never rise high in the scale either of power or of culture. Great peoples must have, in addition, the governmental capacity, which comes only when individuals fully recognize their duties to one another and to the whole body politic and are able to join together in feats of constructive statesmanship and of honest and effective administration. The old pioneer days are gone with their roughness and their hardship, their incredible toil and their wild half-savage romance. But the need for the pioneer virtues remains the same as ever. The pe peculiar frontier conditions have vanished, but the manliness and stalwart hardihood of the frontiermen can be given even freer scope under the conditions surrounding the complex industrialism of the present day. In this great region acquired for our people under the presidency of Jefferson, this region stretching from the Gulf to the Canadian border, from the Mississippi to the Rockies, the material and social progress has been so vast that alike for weal and for woe, its people now share the opportunities and bear the burdens common to the entire civilized world. The problems before us are fundamentally the same east and west of the Mississippi, in the new states and in the old, and exactly the same qualities are required for their successful solution. We meet here today to commemorate a great event, an event which marks an era in statesmanship no less than in pioneering. It is fitting that we should pay our homage in words, but we must in honor make our words good our words good by deeds. We have every right to take a just pride in the great deeds of our forefathers, but we show ourselves unworthy to be their descendants if we make what they did an excuse for our lying supine instead of an incentive to the effort to show ourselves by our acts worthy of them. And the administration of city, state, and nation, and the management of our home life and the conduct of our business and social relations, we are bound to show certain high and fine qualities of character under penalty of seeing the whole heart of our civilization eaten out while the body still lives. We justly pride ourselves on our marvelous material prosperity, and such prosperity must exist in order to establish a foundation upon which a higher life can be built. But unless we do, in very fact, build this higher life thereon, the material prosperity itself will go for but very little. Now, in 1903, in the altered conditions, we must meet the changed and changing problems with the spirit shown by the men who in 1803 and in the subsequent years gained, explored, conquered, and settled this vast territory, then a desert, now filled with thriving and populous states. The old days were great because the men who lived in them had mighty qualities. We must make the new days great by showing these same qualities. We must insist upon courage and resolution, upon hardihood, tenacity, and fertility in resource. We must insist upon the strong, virile virtues and we must insist no less upon the virtues of self-restraint, self-mastery, regard for the rights of others. We must show our abhorrence of cruelty, brutality, and corruption in public and in private life alike. If we come short in any of these qualities, 
we shall measurably fail. And if, as I believe, we surely shall, we develop these qualities in the future to an even greater degree than in the past, then in the century now beginning, we shall make of this republic the freest and most orderly, the most just and most mighty nation which has ever come forth from the womb of time. Oh, closer to 26 minutes. That's a half hour of Teddy Talks. It felt good on this end. I hope you enjoyed it on that end. What an inspiration to hear the words of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, at least for me, I hope it was for you. We'll see you here uh, for the uh, first program in May. May 1st, we'll uh, relive Theodore Roosevelt's role in the Battle of Manila Bay, uh, the uh, creation of the hero, Admiral George Dewey, uh, who uh, uh, on that uh, date told his commander, Gridley, you may fire when ready. Uh, and that will be our uh, clarion call out at the Bully Pulpit Golf Course in Medora tomorrow. Fire when ready. We're ready to do it smart and cautiously and well. We look forward to seeing you here in Medora. Bully for Teddy Talks. Thanks for being here. Goodbye. Good luck.